Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. As the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the globe, death rates varied dramatically by region and by country. Now, we often attribute this to different policy responses, the timing and enforcement of lockdowns or vaccine mandates or things like that, along with more fundamental factors like age or income or health system resources. But according to today's guest, there's another way of looking at this variation. It has to do with understanding the feedback loop between policy and the response to that policy. This data-driven approach to understanding variation provides some important insights into how the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded and how we should think about our response to future pandemics. What can we learn from this novel approach? Well, that's the topic of today's episode of A Health Policy. I'm here with Si Young Lim, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Lim and co-authors published a paper in the December 2023 issue of Health Affairs examining the reasons for heterogeneous COVID-19 death rates across countries. They found that policy responses were an insufficient explanation, but variation in responsiveness to policy measured by a community's adaptability to policy did matter. We'll discuss these concepts and these findings in today's episode. Dr. Lim, welcome to the program. Happy to be here. So let's start with the motivation of your paper, which I actually think takes a few minutes to explore and is worthwhile. Anyone who sort of watched the pandemic unfold saw death rates varying greatly across countries. And we spent a lot of time looking at policy. And I think the assumption was, well, different countries did differently because their policies were different. The motivation in your paper is really that the policy differences don't align very much with the results that we found in terms of COVID deaths. So given how much attention has been focused on the varying policy response, why do you start with this notion that it's really not policy primarily that uh, should be the starting point for our analysis? So broadly, there's there's two reasons. Um, the first is, as you pointed out, death rates have varied very widely, and you know people are aware of that. But I think it, it's worth repeating that they varied by over 100 times. Per capita mortality rates vary by over 100 times across different countries. That's a huge amount of variation. And there have been many studies of the effectiveness of different policies on reducing death rates. But the thing is, the findings have often been somewhat inconclusive. Some studies show that certain policies like you know, social distancing or lockdowns or whatever have substantial impacts, and other studies find that, that they don't. And so this presents something of a puzzle. You know, why do we see these mixed results? That's the first reason. The second reason is a bit more methodological, which is that most models that we have of epidemics, of outbreaks, are missing this key feedback, which we use, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, where Uh, essentially policy or behavior changes in response to the state of the outbreak. And we realized that missing piece could actually explain a lot of the variation that we see in the mortality rates. So before we go deeper into that, that was a very very helpful starting point. One of the other things I thought I saw in the paper is the claim that actually the policies didn't differ all that much. And I guess, again, for a journal that's focused a lot on analyzing the policy. That was a a little jarring to read. So what do you mean when you say that? Yeah, so it's important to be clear about what we mean by the policies. We use, in at least in the paper, we use the Oxford COVID Government Response Trackers Index, which tracks a suite of different policy actions, essentially, that different governments have taken. For example, closing schools or mandatory lockdowns or restricting large gatherings and so on. What we mean when we say, you know, the policies didn't really differ that much is that all countries were reliant on pretty much the same suite of tools. Um, all of these non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, as they're sometimes called. And all countries adopted these different tools at different points. And so in terms of what countries did, the actual policy actions taken, there's not really that much variation across countries. And we see this reflected in the Oxford Index, where you see most of the values there are concentrated among a fairly small range. Where we do see differences is in when and how and why different countries have deployed these policy responses. And we'll get into that more. 
Yeah, so I think that's a great uh, tee up for the next sort of area that I want to talk to you about. There's this feedback loop, and I think we all lived it, right? We saw policies adopted either in response to things happening. We saw people either adhering to policies or objecting to policies, or even the policies didn't change, but people's own perception of their risk would change. So you have this concept in the paper called responsiveness, and uh, that's sort of, I think, a shorthand for the feedback loop you started to describe. So say a little more about what this uh, dimension is and, and how you use the word. Wonderful question. This is really key to the whole paper. So the idea of responsiveness is, on the one hand, it's how sensitive countries or communities or societies are to the threat of an emerging outbreak. And on the other hand, it's how readily they respond to that. I mentioned a moment ago that most countries across over the course of the pandemic adopted at various times at various points roughly comparable measures having school closures or lockdowns and so on but they adopted these measures at very different times and at very different states of the outbreak so if you think about how an outbreak evolves right you have a growing outbreak infections are spreading cases are rising hospitalizations are rising people stop dying eventually some combination of government or people's own perceptions starts to say, hang on, things are bad, we need to do something about this. And so people take actions, whether mandated by government or just uh, of their own accord, to bring down infection rates. So they stay at home, for example. And eventually that outbreak starts to subside, cases come down, deaths come down, and eventually it gets under control. And then in the longer term, kind of memory of that wave starts to fade a bit and people start to relax their, their, their interventions. And that sets the stage for another wave to emerge, right? This is the, the feedback loop that you're referring to, where the state of the outbreak is really kind of driving in a way what people are doing in response to it. Now, where responsiveness comes in is some people, some countries will take action when there are very few cases. They'll say, this is bad, we need to get on top of this. They'll take action much more readily, whereas others are more willing to wait until things get worse, until there are higher death rates and so on, before eventually they say, okay, we should probably do something about this and take action. And that difference, that is a difference in what we term responsiveness. Okay, so this is where, you know, I, it's so helpful, I think, to sort of map this onto personal experience, acknowledging that it varies tremendously around the world. But what I think I'm hearing you say is basically that policy, which is what we often study, the implementation of a particular intervention, the timing of it, happens simultaneously with people's response to the pandemic. And one of the responses is to adopt policy which can happen faster or slower, depending on lots of things. And another response is behavioral, which can also happen faster or slower, depending on people's perception of risk. And that if you just isolate policy as the explanatory variable, if you will, you're missing this whole dynamic that both affects policy and affects outcomes. Is that, did I, am I, am I close? There's two components, and I think you've got one of them, which is that it's not just, you know, what actually happens, ultimately what affects the state of or, or the trajectory of the epidemic is the transmission of the disease. And what affects that is what people are actually doing to restrict or limit that, right? It doesn't matter what the official policy is. What matters is the combination of the official policy as well as people's behavior, whether they're doing less, you know, not really adhering to the rules, or if they're doing more. In some cases, you might have people being more proactive than their government. So that's one piece of it, which is that ultimately, it's the combination of policy and behavioral factors that governs the, you know, that affects the trajectory of the epidemic. The other piece of it is that those policy and behavioral actions are themselves driven by the state of the epidemic. And so as things are bad as, you know, cases are high or in in the case of uh, this paper, we use deaths as deaths or perceived death rates are high. People are more likely to take actions to try to control the outbreak. If those cases or death counts are low, if awareness is low, then people are more likely to relax. Okay, so we began the discussion with the observation, your observation and the data behind it, that 
policy variability in and of itself is not particularly helpful in describing the variability in COVID deaths. So when you add in this dimension you've just described, do we start to feel like we have a better picture? Yes. So that's the key finding of the paper. If we look at just policy responses and whether they correlate with deaths, you don't see much correlation. And if you think about the endogenous, the feedback process, which I just described, it starts to become clear why, right? Sometimes If you have strong policy actions in place, lockdowns and so on, that may be something that is going to reduce death rates and results in low death rates. But it could just as well be something that's happened in response to high death rates. So it could be that things were bad and that's why now you have a lockdown, right? So simply looking at the relationship between policies and and outcomes, death rates, is not going to yield a clear relationship. But if we look at responsiveness, which is the dimension that we've added here, then we start to see a very clear correlation or relationship between responsiveness and death rates. The more responsive a country is, so we looked across countries, you can think of it more broadly across societies, but the more responsive a country is, the lower the death rates on average are going to be. And that's simply because they don't wait for things to get bad before taking action to curb an outbreak. Whereas a country that is less responsive is slower to act. They are, you know, more or conversely, they're more willing to to tolerate higher death rates and a worse situation before eventually taking action. And so on average, the death rates that you see in less responsive countries are much higher. And in fact, this correlation that we see is very strong and it explains a lot of the variation, about 60% of the variation in death rates. Okay, so now I think we have a clearer picture of the mechanism that makes it possible to understand uh, variation. I want to ask you some questions about what we know about responsiveness, which seems now to be such a critical element. We'll talk about that after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Siang Lim about a paper discussing responsiveness as a critical factor in understanding country-level variations in death rates from the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we took the break, we had sort of the pieces of the research come together to explain why just looking at policy alone doesn't give you the picture you need to understand the dynamics. But when you add this concept of responsiveness, the data line up much more clearly with the results of the pandemic. And conceptually, again, as you described it so nicely before the break, The notion that if you're out front when some problem emerges, you're more likely to have a better response. And if you wait and let things get worse, you're likely to have a less good response. That makes sense to me. But that then just sort of raises the question of, okay, if responsiveness is so important, what do we know about it? Where is it high? Where is it low? What factors uh, begin to help us understand why it is higher or lower in in certain places than uh, compared to others? The short answer to what we know about it is not enough. We naturally ask the question that you're asking me, which is what's really driving this variation in responsiveness, because it's, as you said, so important to factor. We looked at Hofstede's cultural dimensions, which I should say I'm not the main expert on. Uh, one of my co-authors was the lead on that part of the paper, so I, hopefully I'll get everything right here. But you know, these are cultural constructs that reflect a lot of, that are used commonly to, to capture broad cultural differences between um, different countries and different societies. And so we found that there are two of the dimensions, two of the cultural constructs that relate fairly strongly to responsiveness. The first is what's called the power distance index, which roughly speaking, power distance is how comfortable you are with hierarchy or with authority. So that kind of makes sense. You know, high power distance index countries or societies are places where people tend to be more comfortable with listening to authority, whether that's to governmental authority or just to expertise, for example. You know, if people are more willing to accept guidance or or direction of experts or of government, then that allows for a, a more coordinated societal response. That part makes sense. The other dimension we found that correlates fairly well with responsiveness is openness to uncertainty. And this might be a bit more confusing. So openness to uncertainty is 
about sort of tolerance for ambiguity or for uncertainty. And our idea, what, what we think is going on here, is that essentially being a responsive country requires a good degree of flexibility, right? It requires being able to say, for example, that we just reopened the schools and things are okay now, but if things get bad next week, we'll need to close them again. And, you know, that, that creates a lot of uncertainty because you need to have this flexible, dynamic, constantly changing, constantly adjusting response. And not everyone's going to be comfortable with that. And societies that are more comfortable with that tend to be more able to pull it off. That said, these two dimensions together only explain about roughly a third to half of the variation that we see in responsiveness. So it's not purely about these deeper cultural factors. And in a way, that's good news because that means there's some room, you know, it's hard to change deep cultural factors, but there's more room to change other things. So you know, to some extent, it's probably a matter of preparedness. Pandemic preparedness plays, we would guess, a substantial role, where if you have the infrastructure and the plans in place to do rapid monitoring, to rapidly disseminate information to people, people understand what it means that there is an outbreak and what why they need to respond. If there are these pieces already in place, that allows you to move more swiftly and more more dynamically uh, in the face of a changing outbreak. So those are factors as well, probably. So we're really bad, at least here in the U.S., about sort of making a lot of cultural assumptions. You know, this sort of people or this part of the country, people are like this and like that. So I get nervous about going down that road. But one thing that does come to my mind as you describe these differences is that We've talked about policies being, you know, the policy toolkit being relatively standardized around the world, but there are other things that we know are highly variable, and and you noted the the huge variation in death rates, but, you know, just pure income levels, resources, uh, the underlying, the age distribution within the country has a big effect on death rates, or just how well this health system functions or how many resources it has. So what I'm trying to do is now map the responsiveness concept, these linkages to responsiveness, which I understand you said were only partially explanatory, to some of these other dimensions. So just to be very uh, simplistic about it, if countries that had the the power gradient that you described were also high-income countries, you would say, well, is it because of the power gradient or is it because they just have a lot of money? And I know that's not the right example, but I'm, how, how do we disentangle between those sort of country factors that we know should be associated with COVID and these, what you refer to sort of more as cultural factors? It's funny that you should bring those up because we actually do examine a good number of those health system capacity, income, you know, GDP per capita, as well as age, because we know that age, at least for a given case, age has a substantial impact on how likely you are to survive with COVID. And what we found is that actually none of these other factors have a significant explanatory role when you look at the inter-country variation in mortality rates. Age does have some impact on mortality rates, as you might expect, but it's not a very significant impact. And responsiveness was, of of these several factors, actually the only one that helped to explain the long-term average mortality rates. And I'm I'm sure that that's somewhat puzzling, but essentially what it is, is that these various factors all help a country to cope better with a given size of outbreak, shall we say. You know, having greater health system capacity, for example, probably means that uh, you have better infection fatality rates because you have more access to hospitalization, you have more access to treatments and so on. But ultimately, in a way, that just means that things can be a little bit worse before you start to think, oh, things are bad, maybe we should do something about it. If you're not prepared to say these various advantages that we have, let's use them to provide us the safety margin where we can say, oh, it looks like infection is still spreading, we should take action sooner, then you're just going to wait until things get bad anyway. That's really fascinating. Okay, so as we come to uh, the end of our conversation, of course, we're trying to draw lessons from this uh, horrible experience that swept the world. And the notion of understanding responsiveness emerges clearly from your paper. As you mentioned, the limited correlation between these cultural dimensions, but the existence of a correlation between them and responsiveness gives us both 
a place to focus and some reason to believe we can do something about it because, as you noted, cultures are hard to change. So how do we sort of step back, or I'd, I would ask you as we finish to sort of step back and say, okay, you've helped me really reframe how I think about what's important in responding to the pandemic. What do we do with that new insight to help us uh, prepare and do better next time? I think there's one more reframing, as you put it, that is in order here, which is the the idea of of a trade-off between um, health outcomes and social economic outcomes, right? And this is something that's been kind of bandied around a lot, both during and you know after the pandemic, or you know we're not really after the pandemic yet, but the idea that we have to choose between protecting health or preserving social and economic functioning. This is something of a false dichotomy, and I think that's the biggest lesson that we have from our finding. Why do I say this? So, if you talk about the cost of various policies. There is an obvious and immediate cost in that, you know, if you close the schools or if you restrict gatherings or you close restaurants, there's an immediate impact, right? Uh, but a cost is not the same thing as a trade-off. A trade-off implies that we can that we can say, okay, we want more of one at the cost of more or, or less of the other. Right. But that's what we find here is that that's not the case, because ultimately, in terms of the policy responses, coming back to that, the policy responses that all countries adopt in the end are roughly comparable. And the reason for that is simple. We are all dealing, we were all dealing with more or less the same virus. Right. You know, there's variants and all that, but it's fundamentally essentially the same virus and the same problem. And the suite of actions that we have, the suite of tools that we have to deal with that is basically the same. And whether you act sooner or, you know, at lower levels, lower sizes of outbreak or later, you're ultimately going to be relying on the same suite of tools and you're going to need to take roughly the same degree of action. So in terms of that impact, the immediate cost and the immediate impact of those actions you need to take, it's not going to be all that different. But what is going to be very different is the health outcomes that you get as a result. So you could have, you know, if you're proactive, if you try and get out in front of an emerging outbreak, you get through it with relatively few um, cases, infections and deaths. Whereas if you are slow, if you wait until things get really bad before your hand is forced, ultimately, you still need to take those same set of policy actions anyway. But you've only done it when things have gotten quite bad. And so you suffer far more deaths as a result. And so it's not that they, that actions to uh, address an outbreak don't have any cost. Why I say there's no trade-off is that you pay the same cost, but you could have far worse outcomes if you're not doing it very proactively, or you could have far better outcomes if you are proactive about it. And I think that's the, the, the biggest lesson that we can draw from this. It's really, really valuable to be proactive, to be readily responsive, and realize that if you don't, you're going to have to act sooner or later anyway, so you might as well do it sooner. Well, that is a pretty profound conclusion, actually, because again, I think People tend to focus so much on the difference in response. And what you're saying is that largely what there's a difference in timing of response. I, I won't repeat your words, but basically, if you're going to do it anyway, you might as well do it when it has the most effect from a health perspective. Um, and that is very different from thinking of as a trade off between economic growth and health. Any final thoughts? Uh, because that really is a, cr a critical ending point, but any final thoughts about? Uh, you said we don't really understand responsiveness quite as well as we might want to or what we might do to try to increase responsiveness uh, just as we uh, finish up our conversation. I guess one last point is that, you know, in this in this paper, at least to keep things simple, we treated responsiveness as static, as a sort of fixed quality of different countries. Uh, in reality, it's not necessarily static. It's probably something that does change over time, over longer time scales, you know, months to years. And there are processes that could plausibly help improve it. So, for example, countries that handled the early stages of the pandemic well, people that probably helped build people's trust in each other, in their governments and so on. And that probably contributed to higher responsiveness going forward, increased ability to be flexible. And what that, that self-reinforcing process means is that it's 
extra important, even more important to really try and get this right from the beginning. You know, that's uh, so interesting because it suggests that there's sort of general responsiveness and particular responsiveness and that there may be sort of a background level of the variable you describe, but there's also, because of the feedback loop, uh, on any particular topic, responsiveness might increase or decrease based on very particular events that have nothing to do with the cultural backdrop or the norms in the country. Well, this is such a fascinating uh, topic. Dr. Lim, thank you for the paper for explaining it. And and really, I mean this quite sincerely, giving me and hopefully our listeners just a really different way of thinking about how the pandemic unfolded and how we, forgive me for using the term, how we responded uh, to it, but uh, how responsiveness to policy is perhaps equally, if not more important than the policy itself. It's a tremendous insight, and hopefully we can use it uh, to do better next time. So thank you for the paper and the explanation. Thanks for being my guest today on Health Policy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about the Health Policy.